All right, uh, I think the next up is our software group. Uh, Kevin Batchelder and actually all of our developing team is here, right? Dylan's here. Dylan can raise his hand so you know who Dylan is. Bob's here and he stepped out. Okay, Bob's here too. He's, he's not around, but Kevin's here so he can take over. All right, well, uh, good morning. Uh, it's another year, time for another software update. Um, it's been two years since we've had this meeting, so I'll be covering uh, what's changed in the last couple of years. So, um, do we have a free presentation? I think we do it somewhere. Try to get it on the screen here. Um, I know the first slide, I know the title of my presentation is what's a little different about Cedar, but the first slide we're just going to cover Bird 75. Short answer is not much has happened in the last two years, but there's only one slide on Bird. Um, EPA gave us uh, a little bit of trouble about uh, reporting uh, NOx and O2. On, on NOx dealing systems, and even when uh, if you use it for unavailable hours, uh, so it's great to have that quantification and then LOC will be seen for the case if you And then they made a bunch of changes for monitored bypass stacks. So there was a couple of customers who, who do have a bypass stack, and they have a sentence on both the main stack and the bypass stack. Uh, so those were, that was MVC 47 and 48 if you care, and you probably don't because you probably don't have a lot of those like that. But, uh, anyway, those are the most significant changes in brooms over the last few years, and that, uh, that's about all I have to say about brooms. Not a whole lot to change. So we will go ahead and move on to uh, uh, the next thing. So hopefully, that will be on the screen here in just a second. <laughs> Sorry, just one second. Um, what order is going to come up on the screen here? So, let's talk about something while we wait for that to come up. Um, Calibrations. Um, they made some changes to the, the uh, calibration <coughs> checks here over the last couple of years. Uh, one thing that was requested, I believe, in this very group meeting, was uh, to check for calibrating uh, gas at the time that the calibration was performed. The, the cal gas is at a range, and we're raising alarm for that, so that is that alarm from the system. And also checks for an expired cylinder. So if the, if the uh, expiration date is, is past the cow date, now we're getting a lot of old stuff. Um, linearities, uh, we have something similar on linearities. Uh, again, if it's out of range, you know, because uh, on linearities it expects your I mean, high gas to be 80, 80 to 100%, and the mid is. 50 to 60, the low is 20 to 30, somewhere in there. Um, when when a linearity or a CPA, either one, uh, when, when it runs, if the reference gas is outside of that range, you will see an alarm. So, uh, same thing, it will also check the expiration of the um, So that's that's in there. All right. Excuse me, Kevin. Yes. Uh, there's some people saying that they have to have a hard time hearing you because you have to mic a bit. Smaller than the mic. Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, what's the advance? I don't know. There's, and there's a pointer on there. There we go. All right. We've got a breeze. Okay, redundant Cedar servers. We've spent a lot of development time on this over the last couple of years. Uh, 
Um, I may have mentioned this at our last uh, user group meeting two years ago. Uh, we've done a great deal of development work since then, uh, improved the, the performance and uh, how well it works, and all the data that gets synchronized and covered. Anyway, the basic idea is um, Cedar can run on two servers simultaneously. We call one the primary, one the secondary. They both run all the time. And the Cedar Day monitor, which the operators see, uh, connects to the primary by default. So it's, it's always looking at that one. Uh, if for some reason, the primary goes down, whether that's a power failure, operating system crashes. Actually, the most common reason is uh, um, system updates. So, you know, the IT group wants to make sure they keep all, you know, up with all the operating system updates. So they'll push updates back to the server. Um, so the primary goes down, secondary is still running, and it takes over, it, it figures out, primary went down. Um, and it takes over ready to the PLC. The Cedar data monitor that is running in the control room that the operators are watching that also sees the primary went down, it switches over to secondary. Then there'll be an alarm saying, hey, you know, switch over to secondary, you're okay. And don't worry about it. But uh, when the primary comes back up, um, it'll take back over, pop into the PLC, the Cedar Day monitor will automatically switch back to the, the primary and, and all that goes on. Um, it is meant to be as, as seamless as possible. So that's that's the idea. And those are physical servers. How about a virtual servers where we do this? Yes, it will do it on virtual servers. However, I highly recommend running them on separate physical sometimes the, the host itself has to be updated. So if they're both running, they're both primary and secondary are on, on one host, and they're still a single point of failure. But yes, we have a number of these running on uh, uh, virtual servers. And again, two, you know, two separate physical machines that, that uh, running on a VM and, and on both of them. I don't know how many of these we have. I'm guessing there's at least 30 sites running this right now. I, I know it's a lot. A lot for me. Um, the data synchronization between the, the, the primary and the secondary database, uh, that it doesn't happen in, in quite in real time. There's there's a five minute to ten minute lag, sometimes maybe a little bit longer. Uh, but generally within ten minutes, the data that, that the primary writes to this database gets synced over to the, the database on the secondary. So that, that all happens behind the scenes. Normally within within ten minutes the, the two databases are That's not historical data. That is, um, yeah, they, they, uh, both servers talk to the PLC independently, so they both read the data from the PLC themselves. So the, the data will be slightly different in real time because they're both you know, they're not reading it exactly at the same time. But um, the data that gets written to the database, like the one minute averages, the one hour averages, the uh, QHS, all that stuff, that gets synced so the two databases have the same data. When does the synchronization happen? Uh, about 10 minutes after the fact. Switch over? So, so the, uh, not, not a switch over, but the synchronization is ongoing. It just has about a, about a 10 minute lag. So it's, it's continually updating the data 10 minutes old. Five minutes old to older. But so within about 10 minutes, the, the same process is up to date. Okay. Uh, 
Okay. Um, part 60 can have a count fail out of control four times the performance spec. You're probably familiar with this one. This is the, the, the worst case count failure for part 60. Um, if the analyzer fails to count by more than four times the performance spec, then the data has to be invalidated all the way back to the previous pass count. That's the one you really don't want. Uh, for a long time, CEDAR did not do that that uh, back invalidation automatically. Uh, we've had numerous requests to go ahead and, and do that, so we have implemented that in the CEDAR software, and that uses monitor code 74. So that is a monitor code you don't ever want to see. Yes, I think you have a question, question on that. We just had at one of our plants, this, they had an event just like this, and we're required to do data substitution for the mass emissions, and so, our a person was struggling with that monitor, monitor code 74 is in there, but if you do data substitution for the mass emissions, that monitor, monitor code masks it when you do your day, daily totals. Or we could we could figure out how to how to how to put the data in there and not change the monitor code. Okay. So okay. I don't know. I mean, do we need a, a separate monitor code that says data substitution and data was invalid or something like that? Or, and this literally happened last week, so I haven't had a chance to it. Look depends. At the, so the question the question had to do with data substitution after uh, monitor code 74. And yeah. I think this applies just not just it's not just to 74, but I think it's a might be it's a general question. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, the but we, we might have to go look at the exact data you, you you're looking at. But the, um, I believe the downtime, the, the calculations that calculate the percent downtime uh, count the substitute data monitor codes as downtime. If I remember so, correctly. That's so that was one option. There's a monitor code for, for data substitute. Because there's a whole bunch of monitor codes, right? like 40 through like 51 or 52 yeah. or something, they're all... They're so if we change that monitoring code to data substitution and it's the, for, for Part 60 reporting, it's still calculated correctly? I believe it still counts those as down. Okay. Right. Um, yes. Brian, yeah, Brian, Brian just chimed question. in. Yeah, he said, uh, to answer Dave's question, the substituted data monitor codes are still considered to be invalid monitor codes and are downtimes. Okay, so, so there, yeah, uh, that's the answer. So then, we, <laughs> so, so then, so then it, we should just change the monitoring codes to our, that we did the data substitution and... Yes. Okay. So, so pick one of those. Okay. Most of them are they're, they're in the 40s to like 51, 52. Pick one of those monitor codes. It's considered valid data for aggregation purposes, but it's considered downtime for downtime calculation. So thank you, Brian, for confirming that. Obviously, he's at home listening to me. All right. Uh, okay, next slide. That was uh, monitor code 74. Monitor code 75, we've added back here in the last couple of years. Um, this is uh, something that has always been in CEDAR. We just never had a, a, an explicit monitor code for it. This is the Part 75 case where an hour can be valid with only two valid 15-minute blocks in the hour, as long as one or two of the other blocks had calibration emissions performed. So uh, CEDAR now has an explicit monitor code for this. Ran into a case, I forget where it was, I think it was Alberta, where they actually needed this monitor. So, anyway, so that is in the software now. Uh, again, it only applies to part 75, and it is valid, of course, because it's valid. All right, how checks expired cylinders. I think I already covered this one while we were waiting for the uh, slide to come up. 
Uh, one thing that is on the slide here is if you print the cow report and you have color turned on, you this the color turned off is an option for that. The uh, expired cylinder will show up and there'll be a notice in red for that cow that has an expired cylinder. That shows up on the, on the cow report. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is there's a feature in the software that just automatically checks for cylinder expiration dates. Uh, if it goes through all the cylinders, the cow cylinders, CJ cylinders, cylinders, checks them all. And if any of them uh, are going to expire in the next 60 days, it starts popping an alarm locally. And it says, hey, this cylinder is going to expire so when it's coming up soon. If it's a cow cylinder, it's probably not a big deal because you're probably going to change it out anyway. Cow cylinders usually are not going to get this. Uh, the only one you really might see this on realistically is the CPU or the cylinder that you rarely use. So you shouldn't ever, you probably won't ever see this alarm, but the check is in the system. So, uh, it used to be that these checks started 45 days ahead of uh, when the cylinders expired, and we got some feedback uh, from a couple of plants saying, well, that's, you know, 45 days isn't quite long enough for our, our uh, purchase and, and receive cycle, so we bumped it up. Okay, CGA linearity, out of range gas. I think we already covered this. Uh, again, there's a red notification in the report. Uh, if there's an expired cylinder for the CGA linearity, or if the uh, reference gas is, is not in the expected range. All right, report date selection. I've got some screenshots coming up. Yes. Yeah. Sure. When will we start seeing the When will we start seeing the cow check alarms? That's the question. When will we start seeing? Let me go back to the last slide. Now, the cow check alarms being the, uh, the cylinder date. Probably the four times. Oh, the four times? I have to go back to that slide and look, but it's got the CEDAR release number on the bottom of the slide. So if you're at least at that CEDAR release number, um, it would be there. This one, this one here says that uh, it's at CEDAR 7.0, so if you've got CEDAR 7, you should have it. Um, what's he saying? Yes. Brian's saying, uh, but your, all of your sites are new enough to have those ones. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> so that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> all of the sites are, uh, the person who's asking has, has uh, new software. <laughs> Okay, so let's get back to screenshots that have to do with the report generator. Uh, we changed the date selection in the report generator. Uh, we've gotten a little bit of feedback, I think, from this group a couple of years ago, and maybe earlier, on making the uh, date selection a, a little easier and adding some more options. Um, so, here we go. Let's look at some screenshots. Um, so, the thing we're interested in is over here on this side where it says days and there's uh, several options here options for yesterday is self-explanatory so we yesterday uh, here's this other new option last 70 days you can pick how many days you want and if you want today as well you can check the box uh, so that's and that will change if you're on monthly report it's this month last month last X months whatever same thing with hours. I think hours actually give you, you know, it'll give you today. So let's look at the next one. And the yellow that you're seeing here is, is part of the software. That, that's not just something I added for, this, for us to look at. That, that's actually in the software. So whichever one is 
highlighted in yellow is the one that's being picked. So this one, there's a permanent, there's a permanent two. You can pick a quarter. Uh, you can pick half a year, or you can pick the entire year, which would be all four quarters. The two box is optional. If you leave the two blank, all you get is just the color. And that's it. So on the, now not on this so uh, yes. But when you do select hourly, you, know, you don't have the option to go to type that 24 hour time. Why is that? Ah, okay. You have to go to AM, PM, you know, put it in 12 hours. Yeah, yeah uh, you can put in. <clears throat> Exactly. See, Cedar will handle 24 hour or 12 hour for me. And you can type it in uh, down here if you want to go to a specific hour. But if you use the uh, selector for the drop down, you have to put it in. Yeah. Okay, I don't have that screenshot. <laughs> um, so when it comes up, it doesn't do 24 hours? I know you can type it in right there. Right here, right there. But then you click the you know, click the little button next to it, and then then you have your drop down. So select the date or time. Okay. You can't select one. It's only a twelve-hour format. I believe, if I remember correctly, if the operating system is set on a twenty-four-hour clock, it'll give you a twenty-four-hour clock. If the operating system is set on a twelve-hour, it'll give you a twelve-hour. We could go in and change that, so we would check the box and you could have 24 hours, four minutes instead, but it doesn't work for that way right now. So, not a bad idea. Well, I'll check that out when I get back. Okay. Yeah, make sure that here's 24 hours and see if it. Okay, well, it should be an email. So, all right. Um, quarter of the, the I will mention the thing that's missing here. You see this big blank space? That's where you can pick months. Well, months don't apply to quarters, so that would just doesn't apply here. So we'll go to the next one, which I believe is a month. And here's our here's our choices. So here's our months. And again, we've got the year and the month. You leave the two blank and and you just get the one month. So something that trips me up every couple of years, and I have to call Brian. He sets me straight but um on the year pull down it only goes back five years yes and i always forget you can type it in is there any reason not to include all the years in the pull down how far back would you like to go i have to yeah, forever <laughs> forever <laughs> <laughs> you get to the dates from the two and stop with yeah. but i always get stuck on okay if it's not in the pick list then i think i can't do it and I, I know you can type it in but then i forget and uh, I mean, there are times we have to go back and look at data when we're doing permitting or something. Sure. Sure. Okay, yeah, I, I know you can type it in, yeah. and uh, I, I guess I could put some more some more years in the in the date pull down. No. Okay. Probably the reason is uh, the right extension period of five years for terrible. It so, is, but I mean, when we do, I mean, I just got done with the exercise, I had to pull data from a one for permitting. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so sometimes, sometimes you got to go find. You know, it's on twenty years or yeah. years. Well, and just pull down. <laughs> maybe ten. Five, maybe ten. I don't know. Okay. Or you can just butt Brian. I know. I know Brian <laughs> loves getting butt. So. Uh, <laughs> you were you weren't listening, Brian. <laughs> All right. Uh, the other thing, I'll, I'll, I, I know you've already seen it here, but here's this. This is a total new option that we didn't have before. Uh, this change to so the 12 months ending, and uh, you can pick the, the uh, month, the last month of the 12 month period, and it'll print all the data for that month plus the previous 11 months. So I know that was a requested feature. I think, Dave, I think you might have been the one last Yeah, month. thank okay. you. <laughs> I've already used it. Huh? All right. <laughs> so. Okay. I think that's all the screenshots. Oh, I did have one here for 12 months. All right. I think that's all the screenshots I have on the report generator. Alarm email changes. Uh, we changed the options for alarm emails uh, to make them a little bit more granular. Um, 
and there's a new checkbox to completely enable or disable the alarm emails altogether. So let's go look at that screenshot. Uh, here I highlighted it in yellow for this slide. Uh, there used to it used to be there was just one checkbox for serious and one checkbox for warning. There was all of them. Uh, we asked, uh, we got several requests for some more granularity on this. So now, go back to that. so here's the master enable disable checkbox, and then um, you can pick the, the limit. Limit alarms, sense alarms, uh, com failure alarms, and everything else. And you can pick whether you, which ones you want to see and whether you want serious or warning. And any combination of those. Is there any thought to setting that more of like a subscription? So, like, say I have a user, it's uh, my ice tech. He's not going to care about an exceeding so much as he's going to want to know when he has a com failure. I don't. Funny you should mention that because I have that exact request sitting in my to do. Uh, list right now. Okay. So, uh, yes, we, we've had that request for to be able to set up two different lists of users. Right now. I think for the exact scenario you're mentioning. So, possibly even to the right where you have some blank space. So, for the limit, you could go to this guy, the sensor, go to that guy. It could all be the same guy. Right? Sure. Or you could add a list of different lines. Okay. That idea and the design the feature. I haven't even started working on it. So, <laughs> the more feedback, the better. Here, all right. Next slide. It seems data on reports. Uh, I'm sure some of you have seen this already, even if you don't want to. Um, this is another feature you don't really want to see, but it's in the software. So, uh, the, the key part is down here. If there's an exceedance related to this piece of data, notice the limit here is 50. This one is considerably over the limit. Uh, so that shows up in the report uh, with the red, red text. Uh, there is an option in the report generator to turn off the color. So if, if you have the color turned off, you won't see it in red. It will still, the number will still be in bold, so that's kind of a subtle. And that's, and that's a little more subtle. Red stains out of the more. All right, just a few state and local changes I'll mention. Um, San Joaquin Valley, it, it, I don't know if anyone here has anything in San Joaquin, not that it matters. Uh, they completely switched over to internet submittals. They got rid of the ballot board. So that's that. Uh, New Jersey, uh, New Jersey reports of Cedar 4 had them, Cedar 7 now has them, we've all been updated to Cedar 7. Uh, same thing with the Utah electronic report. And there's some more changes coming up here. All of these are pretty much between now and the end of the year, the first part of 2022. Uh, again, South Coast, South Coast uh, they're making some regulatory changes there. Uh, they're finally going to get rid of some of their non-intuitive calculations and uh, join the, the, the world of Part 60 and 75. So that started sometime in 2022. Um, looking forward to that. Maybe not the work, but I'm looking forward to the, it making sense. Um, Alberta, they got a bunch of stuff uh, changing starting January 1, so that's going to be on our plates here over the next three months. And New Jersey recently put out some clarifications on three-hour rollings, uh, and that's due by uh, the first three years as well. So that's all coming up. Uh, all right, so this is the part I really want to take a few minutes and show you. So uh, we have a new feature. This is still in development. It has not been released. Um, but we it is at a point where we can uh, demonstrate it to you. Uh, for a long time, we've had the request for a cylinder manager, cylinder tracker, cylinder tool, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we're, we're sticking with cylinder manager for right now. Uh, 
Uh, the idea is you can go into the cylinder manager and input your list of cylinders. You can do it ahead of time if you want to, or you can do it at the time the cylinder is swapped out. It's, it's up to you. Uh, and you can go into this, this tool and you can grab a cylinder and drag it over on top of an existing cylinder and the system will propagate all of the cylinder data to the system, to everywhere it needs to go out in the system. Uh, right now, uh, all of that is done with either going to the receiver setting screen and typing in, you know, picking each setting individually and typing all those in, uh, or going out to the shelter, and a lot of shelters have Touch panels out in the shelter, or the will be running like either one. Uh, you, you can enter that cylinder data from there, and that still works. So that, that that's that option isn't going to go away with this. Uh, this cylinder manager will 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 work both ways. You you can enter cylinder data in this tool, and when you put the cylinder in service, it'll take that data and it'll propagate it down. So uh, if there are multiple things that, that test that they use that cylinder in the system. Say you've got uh, a NOx CGA and a, and a uh, I'm sorry, a NOx linearity and CO CGA and your, your CO span gas and your NOx span gas, they all use the same cylinder. Uh, this tool will probably, when, when you pick that one cylinder, that one cylinder gets replaced, it will propagate everything out to the PLC. Uh, you know, vendor ID, the cylinder ID, expiration date, gas list, and all the gas concentrations. So with one action, everything go out to the PLC. So let me just ask, so the cylinder manager, we can put all our cylinders from, say, you know, one has these cylinders, and then two has these, and three has these, and four has these, and then we have these spare, we have yes. these here, these put them here. Uh, a bottle gets low, we can change the bottle, we grab a spare bottle, we drag it up into one. Right. Yes. And then we can also print that report. If you need a historical or something else, there's, we don't have any reports for this yet, but uh, we're kind of waiting for some feedback and it would be useful for reports on that. Uh, but this will also work um, if you have. Uh, I know earlier it was mentioned some sites have a, like a, a rack of bottles that are used for linearities on a cart, and they'll loop the, the bottle around to multiple shelters. And this will also work for that. So if the same bottles get used in you know, all the shelters, when you change that, that one bottle in the system, it will propagate that change out to all the shelters. That's back to Breeze as well. Uh, Breeze doesn't care about this because um, this this is upstream of Breeze. Because when when the cow is performed or when the CD, when linearity is performed, it takes whatever the current cylinder settings are and it stores it stores that data with that test. So the, the, this system is about. Uh, when you do a cylinder change out, getting that new data into the PLC. Once it's in the PLC, it gets saved with, with the, the test and the breeze will catch it up. You know, the breeze will get back into it. Okay, so let's go ahead and uh, we can, I'll, I'll move to the next slide, which has a, a screenshot, but if you want to move to. We actually have a live demo here, which is even better than a screenshot. So, awesome. Uh, so, while that's coming up, here's the list of available cylinders on the side. Obviously, it says that. Um, if we want to add a cylinder, you know, punch the button, and a dialog box will come up and can enter the, the cylinder information. On this side, uh, these are the ones that are all in service. This side, has, there, there's two different views on this side. Uh, the one that is selected right now is what we're calling the gas profile. And that is a list of all of the QA tests in the system and all of the 
bottles that are that are used. So, for example, a a linearity, you know, my, my NOx linearity will have a low and then a high. So that'll appear three times in the gas profile section because you know, each of those um, each of those levels needs a separate filling. Uh, there's also a a uh, cylinder list, and that's just the list of all the cylinders that are currently in service. So we can take a cylinder from the available side, click and drag, drag and drop onto the other side, and it doesn't matter which view is picked, whether we we're looking at the cylinder view or we're looking at the gas profile view, either one. We can drop it on either one. And it'll it'll propagate through the, through the whole system. Uh, there is some error checking in there, so um, in case I, I need to swap out a, a bottle with you know from my NOx and CO blended high gas bottle, and I accidentally grab a low gas bottle. Uh, a dialogue the, the dialogue is going to come up and say you know you, there's always a dialogue box. Comes up and says, Do you want to confirm? And in that dialog, there is an error uh, notification that says, uh, Hey, this, this bottle, the gas, the component gases in this bottle doesn't match what, what this test is expecting. So that, that shows up in red. Um, you probably won't have any expired cylinders in here, but those show up in red. Um, it, it, it does some basic error check. Uh, on the cylinders. Um, oh, okay. So all those uh, cylinder appointments get timestamped automatically. Uh, yes, we're we're it does store uh, a history of of what changes were made uh, on the cylinder and what cylinder that was. When and where. So. Yes. Uh, right now, Cedar does have informational alarms, like when the cylinder information changes, and Cedar just automatically generates an informational alarm. Cylinder ID change, the gas concentration change. Here was the old value. Here was the new value. Uh, so yes, we will we'll, we'll bring this forward. Uh, okay, so I think we're up and running, right? Yeah. Also, Kevin, um, yes. I have a question of what's in the gas profiles. What is in the gas profiles? All right, let's uh, let's bring that up here in just a second. Right now we're on the. We'll, we'll, we'll come back. To that. Uh, so on the assigned cylinder side. So here's our. We we'll, we'll get a. A little card here for each of the cylinders that are currently in use. Uh, this cylinder has some errors on it. I know you probably can't read that, but it says the cylinder's expired and it says the, the gas concentration uh, is not what's expected for the test that it's applied to. So there's the red, there's the, the error notes. Uh, in these little colored boxes right here, there's you know the CO concentration, there's the NOx concentration. And those uh, gas types are color coded. Uh, now, on this side, I've got a, I don't, I've got a ton of test cylinders loaded in here. It's kind of overkill. But uh, the, the gas concentrations are all color coded, so it's easier to track um, everything. Here in this this little box is I know you can't read this again either, but this one is saying every. This is listing all the gas profiles where this cylinder is being used. So in this case, this cylinder is being used on German 1A and it's being used for the NOx low cow span and the CO low cow span. And then same thing again on German at the other group. So there, there's a bunch of information packed in this. And this is a little, a little more standard. And it's also in the development. Um, up here, we can filter if we want to filter this to say I just want to look in a free. I can pitch the unit up here or unit one A and M, like one B or something. Uh, most of those are something units. 
So when that happens, it will filter this list only the cylinders that are being used on, on that unit. If it's being used on another unit, that still shows up. But it, we're filtering just the cylinders that are being used on the selected unit. Uh, we can filter the gas profile, and that is uh, uh, like when you take the low gas, we can pick a NOx gas, a high gas, linearity, CO. There's, there's several different options in there. If you want to filter based on what the cylinder has got in it or what it's being used for, you can pick that. Uh, and then up here as well, uh, we can filter based on what's in the cylinder. So there's, there's a lot all the gas types and a whole bunch of other gas types that EPA defines that most people don't use. All right, so let's switch to the gas profile view. Um, and this is a combination of the unit that the, that the cylinder is used on, the uh, test that the cylinder is used for, in, in its level, so like cal span or linearity humidity, uh, and that whole combination makes a, a gas profile. Um, I should explain it a little better than that, but that, that's the idea. Every test in every gas level of every QA test in the system shows up here as a gas profile. And again, if we if if, uh, if we want to change one of these, we can we can pick a new cylinder over on this side and drag it over here. And right here, it's going to say, "Wait a minute! You just grabbed a CO2 cylinder. And you're trying to drop it on on an NO gas profile. Hey, here's here's the error message. You don't really want to do that. So, and there's an example of the error message." Um, and down here, there's the you know, cancel or confirm buttons. It also asks uh, the, the cylinder that's being taken out. We're assuming that it's going to get retired. The, the cylinder's going to get returned to the vent. That's our assumption. And if for some reason you still want to use that cylinder again, you can pick this option, which is put back in spare list. Most of the time, that's not how it works. All right, I think I, there's a whole lot more stuff here. Um, and I don't really have, how am I doing on time? I'm probably fine. Right. So, uh, is that stored database somewhere? Yes, the, the list of available cylinders is stored in the database. Um, so if we add a, you know, when we put a new cylinder here, that that is stored in the database and back up and all the stuff that happens to the database data. The, uh, the in-service, this side, the in-service cylinders and the gas profiles, that is a combination of the SEER configuration and the data that's out of the field. Um, so that the, the, the data on this side is, this this is what the system is using right now. Yes. I have one. Um, how is the allowable range for the gas derived to account for state specific requirements? Is this a user setting? How is the allowable range determined, uh, especially for state specific requirements? So, as you can see here, each, uh, each one of these gas profile cards has a, in this case, it's looking for NO, and there's uh, uh, these regs allow apparently for two different gas ranges. Um, it is the, the answer where, where do these allowable ranges come from? Um, they're basically built into the definition of the test. So if it's a part 75 linearity, we know that it's going to use 20 to 30 percent for low, 50 to 60 percent for mid, 80 to 100 percent for high. Um, the most of the part 60 stuff has a, has a standard set of allowable ranges and the part 75 stuff has a standard set of allowable ranges um, if 
if there's a state specific range that is not that, that doesn't match the, the part 60 allowable range i believe we can change that in new configuration but we, we have a way to change that um dylan is there anything else here we should show at this point probably the feature smart filtering from Oh, that's right. That's awesome. Okay. So, um, here's our list of in-service cylinders. And you can see on this side over here, you know, here's cylinders with a whole bunch of different gases in them. So, this, this uh, if we come over to the in-use side and we click on one of these cylinders, it will filter this list to cylinders that are compatible with what we just clicked over here. So in this case, uh, this one is looking for, you know, right now we've got a, a cylinder with NOx and CO in it. And it knows based on what gas profiles it's being used for, what the allowable ranges of NOx and CO are. And so over on this, once we've clicked it over on this side, and you can pull down the filter. You can see it's here's our min and max NOx that it's looking for, and our min and max CO that it's looking for. And it's filtered the whole list. So <clears throat> I think I've got a thousand cylinders loaded in here right now. That's over here. Um, but you'll probably have, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, 60 cylinders, depending on whatever you've got in for it, potentially in this list. So Clicking this will really cut down the list of cylinder gas filters. So, <clears throat> oh, okay. Yeah, we can do it the, the same thing from over here. And that will work uh, either on, on the cylinder uh, cards or if the gas profile cards are picked, it'll, it'll work on the other one. Questions? Uh, go ahead. No, no. I'm just going to ask. It looks like this is a web based application. Yes. Uh, good observation. <laughs> yes, this is a browser based application. Um, our long term plan is to move Cedar, uh, the, the, the Cedar data monitor, and all the main the Cedar reports, all the main Cedar applications to be browser based. So this is the this is uh, some new development. So this is the first application where we've actually done a browser-based application. So don't expect this next year or even the year after that. Just hold your breath for a long time. But anyway, yeah. that's the direction we're going. This is browser-based. So I actually have two questions. One. So the that cylinder feature. Um, I mean, I don't know if you would use that as for the future models that we might put install uh, yes. than just the ones that are present. Uh, now, the retired models that we no longer in service, is that a place to go in and see it? Uh, those, those by default drop off the available cylinder list once they're retired. So you cannot go back? There is a, there, there is a screen somewhere in here it, we're, we're still working on it, but there, there is a screen in here where you can go back and look at what's been retired. You know, oops, I accidentally retired one, I want to go back out. And the way you do the yes. Uh, we're also, yeah, okay, here we go. Uh, for adding bottles, uh, we're also looking at um, compatibility with a barcode scanner. You can get one of those little barcode scanners and click the uh, scan the QR code. And it'll automatically add. It, it, not that it'll, auto, it, it'll automatically populate the the add cylinder screen for you, and then you can you know, make sure it brought everything in correctly, and then it'll okay. And will we be able to tie our um, add a certificate of calibration of the cert to it? Uh, it's not in the software right now, but we do have the ability to. It's in the database, but it's not in the software yet, where we can uh, store a screenshot of the 
cylinder shape. So, yes, short answer is yes. Uh, the, 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 the barcode scanners, it, it's a great idea. The, the challenge we're running into with the barcode scanners is it depends on the vendor. Uh, some of the vendors on the on the, the search sheet for the bottle, you scan the, the QR code, and the QR code actually has the cylinder information embedded right in the code. Other vendors, uh, you scan the QR code, and it takes you off to a, a web link, a URL, which that's great, except the DAS sits behind the web. So if, if you have if you have a magic solution for how to make that work from behind the firewall, I would love to hear. So anyway. Somehow I don't think we're gonna convince IT departments to let us do the firewall for that. <laughs> All right. Any other uh, any other questions? Any other thoughts? That's that's all I had to present on. So, do you have anything else, whether on this or another topic? So, so this functionality won't be available until CDAR and the data monitor are on on the web. Um. No, I didn't say that. Fortunately, okay. uh, this this is slated to come out sometime next year. I don't have a firm date on that. Uh, but this will this will run in parallel with the existing uh, desktop Windows application that Peter has. So it's it's not an either or of the both. Okay. All right, other topics. Yeah. I mean, one thing I know we've talked about in the past. Any more discussion on um, you know when you're and when you're running an audit report or developing a report and we've got 200 parameters in there to put some kind of parameter tree on there. Yes, I have a plan for that. Okay. You're probably not going to like my answer. Okay. Um, the, the short answer is the it's coming. Uh, the I, I mentioned we're, we're going to a browser-based interface and we're going to add it in the browser-based interface. The, uh, the, the platform that we're currently using, um, it, it's not impossible, but it's very complicated. And we, we know that the browser-based uh, applications are, are much more capable. So I haven't forgotten that one. I think you've asked me that like three years in a row now. Yep. And it's, it's on my, <laughs> it's on my, my to-do list that I, I haven't even forgotten it. That one's actually in my memory. <laughs> so with the QR codes, if, you know, assuming you all move forward with that, um, would you set it up such that you could have a QR code identifying the location, like on the rack? So you scan the QR code, you say, and then you scan the bottle, and that ties the two systems together. I hadn't thought about uh, the possibility of, of tying it to a specific uh, location in the rack. That would be an interesting feature. I guess you'd have to tell the system how you want to identify that QR code you generate. But yeah, we would. I'm not and saying you try to make it idiot proof because we all know how that works. But well, because we all think we're not idiots, and we're <laughs> kind of we are. So. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, we have thought about because the QR codes don't always work. We have thought about uh, incorporating some OCR. Software into it so if you could scan the bottle sheet, maybe you would go through and parse the bottle sheet and read stuff off of that. But every manufacturer has a different format, and the OCR vendors think that their software is wonderful and you know, proof of life. So I'm not sure if we're going to do OCR or not. Just a clarification on when you say browser, that's offline. I think browser, I think internet. But the browser, as in not connected to the internet, yeah. it does still work on the intro. Okay. So no. it, like, everything here would, would be behind the firewall. So if they're behind the firewall and they can make it reach the Cisco server, the, the Cedar server, and they're cool. So for users that um, access the DAS and the reports and the data monitor remotely, um, you open up Cedar reports and you can easily bounce from one facility to another. You can't do that in the data monitor. 
is there a way to add that income into there? The data monitor, I mean, the little thing, but it takes it takes a minute to load, and if you need to bounce around a bunch of different facilities, you know, it saves some time. I didn't. I didn't think anybody wanted to do that. <laughs> <laughs> You're the first person to ask for that. But yeah, that that would be. Oh, I mean, it's not a big deal, but that'd be useful. I mean, it's okay. it's really how the Cedar Reports works that way, and you can bounce from one yes. facility to the next really quickly. So. Yeah, the Cedar Reports, and I think the database editor does that too. Okay. But the reports are probably the two more. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think I, I think I can do it in the monitor. I know I can. Wait for the web version. <laughs> I think I can get through that. <laughs> All right. All right, Dave, did we expand your list of. Uh, of uh... No. No. Okay. All right, yeah, you'll see me at lunch. I'm not sure. I, 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 got, I got one for the last hour. <laughs> You're waiting for the last hour. Well, I don't know if that will help well, me. I, 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 I will bring up one more thing. We talked about it before. And I don't know if it fits here or not, but we talked before about the way that the hourly calculations are made. It's the down and then some, or the sum and then down. And we continue to have, yes. I know we've switched a number of our facilities over to the calculate the, the mass emissions on a minute by minute basis and then sum it for the hour. Okay. Is there more thought on how, whether or not to standardize that across the whole platform? I don't know if I have an answer for that. Brian would probably have a better answer. I think um, Brian has an answer. Okay. Yeah. Um, sure. So Robbie Melinder says you can have multiple sessions of data monitor up at once. And then Brian says to answer Dave's question, there is a limited web version of the data monitor. It doesn't contain all of the same functionality, but has most of the same info. Okay. So, all right. so that's a different question. Uh, yes, we do okay. have a a, um, a limited version of the Cedar Data Monitor right now that is browser based. Um, a, a few sites are actually using that. Um, it, it's not something we get a lot of requests for. But you, the data monitor screens are available in the web browser. Um, Call Brandon has to set it up. But you, you, that wasn't the answer to your question. Yeah, that, that's more of a fundamental how the software is set up. And, you know, it, it work, that, we, that goes to Cedar can be configured to do it either way. Yeah. You know, whether to, to calculate mass at the minute and then sum it all up or calculate mass at the hour and then sum those up. Cedar can be configured either way. And it really goes down to what is the permit rate to require on the two versions. I mean, we're, where we've really seen it, we just had another, another instance where it caused what we call an indicated excess of a limit. And so when you're in calibration for a large chunk of the hour, your PPM values are only going to be average based on the 40 minutes in the hour, right? And if you have a massive change in load and you do the calculations and, and, it's, and it's calculating the mass based on your fuel flow for the hour, which is not massed, you get all 60 minutes of the, of, of the, of the fuel flow. Then you can see that your average, your, your concentration data is average on a different data set than your heat input, and it can skew yes. things. And we, we, it, it pops up every once in a while where we have it. It, it used to be a big deal, uh, you know, just back 15, 20 years ago. Yeah. Almost all the limits were based on block hours or longer. Right. But as we've gotten more into these uh, 60 minute rolling and even shorter, you know, start to shut down limits. Mm -hmm. And load, loads are changing more, and I, I think that's sure. really what's driving it. If your load doesn't change, you're not going to have an issue. Right. Yeah, for steady state, it's, it's yeah. fine. It's, uh, it changes. Yeah. yeah, Brian would have a better answer okay. as to whether that's something you routinely do now or if it's okay. more of a case by case. All right. Any, any other questions? I'd love to talk to you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, if we go by the schedule, uh, we're supposed to have uh, another presentation on spare parts, but if we go by the time on the schedule, it's at all lunchtime. 
Uh, so uh, I don't know that they're ready for lunch out there, but I think probably the best thing to do is let's go ahead and break now. Uh, and then we'll hold to the schedule and we'll insert the spare parts discussion later. Um, this afternoon after lunch, we'll try to start with that right after that. So uh, we'll reconvene at 145 back here. For those of you that are remote, that's not the time. Uh, so you can do the calculation of wherever you are, uh, figure out what time that is. But 145 not time, we'll come back in the room. Uh, lunch will be served out there. I was just out there a few minutes ago, and it's not set up yet. Uh, I think they'll start. They'll probably start serving lunch around there, and so that'll be uh, in a few more minutes. But uh, we'll break now. We'll come back in uh, at 145. Thanks.